And I remember the last time that I was on TV, I'm sitting in a man's house, and then all of a sudden I see my face appear on TV. I couldn't believe it. The police said I was wanted for first degree murder. And I thought, ah, oh, that's a bunch of lies, but it really wasn't because I really was on the run from the law. And uh, things like this. So I wasn't raised in a Christian home and I could care less if there was a God. In fact, when I was young, I didn't even believe that there was a God. I knew somebody created the world, but that's all I knew. And uh, to start with, I'd like to share a couple things with you. Uh, I'm 40 years old and then I shot heroin for over 25 years of my life. And I remember one time, uh, I just got out of jail doing three to six months one time and I went over to a friend's house and we decided to get a couple kegs of beer. So we got them and started drinking it and we decided we need some whiskey. So we went up to the store. In the meantime, I ran into this fellow that I knew. And he's going, I got some really good drugs, Danny. And I go, oh, that's good. Why don't you come on over to the house? So he came over to our house and we went into the restroom and I shot about $100 worth of heroin in my veins. And I ended up overdosing, and they said, I don't ever remember that. And he threw some cold water on me, and he said my face started sizzling. So I knew at that time he'd better rush me to the hospital. So by the time I actually got to the hospital, they pronounced me dead. And the only thing I could remember is I could hear, and that was it. I could not see, I could not speak, I could not move. And uh, the last thing I remember before I went into a deep coma is I was laying on this table that they said, and a doctor was telling these nurses, he's dead. We've tried everything we could to revive him, but he's gone. And so, as far as I know, they uh, put a sheet over me and started wheeling me down to this room, and I wanted to just scream out and say, hey, I'm alive, but I just can't move and tell you people this. Only thing I could hear was just the doctors I couldn't see. I was in a very deep coma, and when I did come out of that coma, I woke woke up in the ICU unit and sure enough there was a handcuff on my arm. I was handcuffed to the bed because I was wanted for another crime in another city. So back to jail I went. That was me off and on most of my whole life. And then another time people say that like a cat you have nine lives. Well I want to share a few things with you. I've been pronounced dead a few times. But for some reason, this God that we've been hearing about wanted me to hang around on this earth for a while, but I didn't know it at the time. So another time, we're cruising down the street, and we decided uh, we needed some more drugs, but we never had no money. So I told my partner, no problem, get the guns out of the back of the car. So we did. And so we just went in and robbed a drugstore and got our morphine that we wanted and started shooting it. And then after we ran out of that, this is in the same evening, by the way. We decided we need some more dope. So we went to another drug store. And in the process of robbing that one, the policeman came. And I remember the cop pulling the gun on me and pulling the trigger. And I'm still here today. And he was like four feet in front of me. So some done, or somebody wanted me to hang around for a while. Now, today, I know who it is. But at that time, I had no idea. I thought, well, I'm just a lucky sucker, you know, and I got away that night. But sooner or later, I got caught. That's just part of life. And then also, I want to tell you about something that happened to me. I was over in the state of California, and I was raised in Phoenix, Arizona. I was over there doing my thing, partying, working, doing drugs, and everything like that. And I was real sick, so I went to the doctor, and the doctor goes, you have hepatitis. I said, no, doctor, it's not hepatitis. I've had it before, and it's just not this. I tell you, I'm dying. He's going, no, I've double-checked you. It's hepatitis again from shooting dope. So I accepted it like I did once before. And then I remember we was in the house this one night, and, well, we was smoking dope and drinking and just having a good old time, we thought. And then all of a sudden, I just started feeling real, real sick. And I could feel my life just actually just fading away. So I called this person and said, I got to get to the airport to fly back to Arizona so I can check myself in a hospital. Well, I'll tell you what, lucky that I did because from the airport from Phoenix, Arizona to this hospital was like 40 some miles. It took the person 22 minutes until I was at the hospital and seeing a doctor. What happened was, as my appendix busted a few days or a week before, 
I'd done so much drugs, I really didn't know, you know. And what happened is I started getting gangrene inside of me and it started eating the insides of my body completely up. And so they rushed me in without me even signing a piece of paper, allowing them to do surgery, surgery on me because I was so weak I couldn't even write my name. And after surgery, uh, a couple days later, because they kept me under the influence of drugs very heavy because they knew from uh, the people that took me there I was a very bad heroin addict. So they kept me sedated very heavily. And then the doctor says, legally, you should not be alive. I don't know how in the world you are really here today. We should have been burying you because there's so much of your body that was ate up. Your organs should not function correctly to, to live. And I told that doctor, well, doctors, one thing, somebody's looking out after me, but I just don't know who it is. You know, I'm just too lucky, and I go on about my own business. But I want to go back, if I may, a little bit in the past and tell you a little bit about me. I was a radical type person. As a very young man, I remember uh, I was depressed most of my life from like the age of 12 and stuff like that. I just hung around the street corners and my home, who would want to go home? All they did was just party there and screaming and hollering. So it wasn't a good place to hang out at at all. I felt uncomfortable there. No one really loved me there, I thought. So I'll just hang out with the guys on the street corner. So that's what I did. Half the time I wouldn't even go to school. Would tell our parents, well, I went to school today. That was a lie. We was out doing drugs and running the streets of Arizona is what we was doing. Doing crime at a young age, at the age 12. I got my first felony. So that blew my profession because I wanted to grow up to be a pharmacist. What a joke, huh? I could get my own dope is what I figured and that's just the way it was. And what I'm sharing with you is the honest God's truth, folks. You know, because we're going to hear some bizarre things that's happened to me in my lifestyle. So at the age 12, we'd hang around and we would want money. Who wanted to work for a living, right? That's a bummer. Have to go out and sweat and work. So we started robbing people. We thought that's a good way to earn a buck. So what we done is stole the gun from one of the parents' that we knew where it was, and we started doing holdups. It was a pretty good living, you know, but sometimes you might hit somebody that's already been partying and might just get a few bucks, you know, so we started thinking, there's got to be a better way to make an honest living. As far as we can, was concerned, that was honest. We took what we wanted. If you didn't like it, tough. That's just the way it was. So we thought we'll start robbing drug stores. That's got to be a good buck in that. So that's what we did. And mind you, we're 12-year-old children at the time, ditching school, doing our own thing. And then late at night, we would go out and rob these drug stores, cut holes in the roof and climb down, steal the drugs. And we were so stupid, we didn't even know what drugs to steal. So one of my friends decided we better go to a library and get a library book on what is the good dope to steal. Wow, what a good idea, brother. So that's what we did. We actually really had to go somewhere and learn something one day. But I'll tell you what, when we heard about this drug called morphine, aha, it was worth taking the afternoon off from doing our regular thing, just kicking back, doing nothing. So we did, and we asked, hey, what's the feeling? So one of my friends, the very first drug store we robbed, were inside the place, and I couldn't even give myself a shot. In the world, you all call it a fix. And we didn't know how to do it, so we just done it the best we could. So we got high right inside of the drugstore. We didn't care if the police came. We figured we'll shoot them. No big deal. And we'll get away. And that is a lifestyle that I led, you know. But today, it's totally different. But I'll share that with you in just a little bit. I want to just take the time right now and ask you people out there, if you're hurting, if you're tired, if you're a drug addict, if you're a prostitute, if you're a pimp, if you kill people for a living, that ain't no big deal. And if you're a real nice person, if you never stole nothing, that ain't no big deal. But later on in this video, we're going to learn something that I hope will change your life. And that is Jesus Christ, because he did change mine. But now, 
let's just get back to what I used to do. And I used to think this was fun. But all the years that I've done this, there was always something different. I always had to do something different. And I was looking for it, and I could never find it. And I felt lousy and empty inside, and not love, not one. And I never had real happiness until there was a needle in my arm, and I was getting a rush off of a fix. And I thought that was true happiness. <laughs> what a bummer. All that then was sent me to the penitentiary and caused me a bunch of grief and pain and agony. See, people will tell you about shooting the dope and getting a good feeling, but they never tell you about the times where we got to go and lock ourselves in a motel room for three to four days by yourself, kicking drugs if you got a habit. That's hell on earth, folks. And let me tell you, I've been there. I know what it's about. At one point in my life, I used to shoot about $500 worth of heroin a day, and that wasn't cut either. That was straight from Mexico or Vietnam. I know. I used to transport drugs in the United States for a living, so I know all about that. But let's get back to what I used to do. And I remember when we would go to school and stuff, we broke our eighth grade teacher's arms. Why? Because we didn't like him. It was that simple. When we was crazy little children. We'd get in and out of trouble. And all we thought is, big deal, we'll get locked up for six months to a year. We're kids. We'll risk it. And I'll tell you what, we got away with a lot of things. But after a while, it caught up with us. It really did. But to start with, I'd like to share a few things. That, the way I grew up, people used to call it the hippie generation. And I remember hearing about hippies and stuff through my parents and stuff. And we're riding down in a car one day. And uh, this person in the car says, there's a hippie. So I started looking all over the place, you know. Well, where is it? Where is it? And come to find out a hippie was supposed to be somebody with long hair. Boy, I got a good laugh out of that one. Big deal. But I'll tell you what, at the time, I thought the hippie generation was about the neatest thing ever. Peace, love, and war. You know, wow, I could enjoy this scene. We used to go to what they call crash pads. We'd go in a house and kick back. You could do all the drugs you wanted. No one would ever stop you. And outside, people would be guarding the house like a crack house nowadays with guns. But all it was was that we were just deceived by the devil. But at the time, we didn't know it. Sometimes we would stay in there three and four days at a time and never come out. And mind you, we're just little children. But I really didn't care what my parents thought. I did what I wanted to do. The reason why, as far as I was concerned, I was God of my life. I'd done as I pleased. If you didn't like it, I could care less. Just the way it was. It was just living on the streets of Arizona. And today, there's people all over the world living like that. They think we're their own boss. We're not, folks. We're bought and paid for. But we'll talk about that a little later. But I'll tell you what. They always say if you want to play, you got to pay. And that is anything in this old life. Because I'll tell you what. In later years, I had to pay, and I still pay, in a lot of areas of my life for the things that I've done. But we'll get back to this hippie life. I'll tell you what. It was a lot of fun, boy. I remember one time my parents split, so me and... A family member decided, oh, let's have some fun. Let's throw a party. So we did. All we done is went to the trunk of a car, opened it up, and we had all the pharmaceutical drugs we wanted. We never had to buy dope because we stole it, and then we sold it. So dope was no big deal. So we had a party, and we decided to paint our bedroom black. Boy, that would be neat. So that's what we done. We painted it black and made it into a crash pad. And that was cool. But it wasn't big enough because people kept coming over, hanging out, and it was getting just too crowded. So what we done, through selling drugs, we had enough finances. We talked our father into building a 12 by 24 room and putting a pool table in it and two doors so we could come and go as we pleased and we wouldn't make enough noise to bother them and soundproof it. He went for the deal. We paid for it. We got it. It was that simple. We had a lot of money. Money was no object in, in them days as a child because we used to sell one little pill for $40 and we used to steal them by the thousands at one time. So like I said, money was no big deal. But then I remember this man moved across the street from where I lived and they called him a biker. And I go, oh, wow, I kind of like that. 
So I started hanging around with this guy. By then, I was 14 years old. So at that time, I was, I was with the hippies and the bikers and all that, and I go, hey, that's pretty neat. And a lot of scooter people, these wasn't wannabes. These are the real people, the real ones out there today that cut your head off for 250 bucks. I know because I know people like that today but I don't associate with them, not unless I shared the Lord with them. But I remember meeting this one man. His, we called him Moses. We'll call him Moses, you know. And, he, and I thought he was the neatest guy ever because he would take this phony money and give it to me, and all I'd have to do is go cash it, buy what I wanted, and give him the change. I go, hey, this is a pretty good deal. Let's get into this, making money. Well, I never did because my dope was making me too much money. And, what I would do is give my drugs to people and go have them sell it, so I wouldn't even have to hassle doing that. I just done as I pleased. But then I started really liking the motorcycles a lot, so I started riding with them and hanging around them and going to their parties and their bashes and their pig roast and things like this. So the next thing I know, the, they're wanting me to join one of the clubs. And I said, no, I'm a loner. I'll never join no club. And remember I was telling us earlier in this video that I always had a loneliness and an empty feeling? Well, it was still with me. Uh, the drugs wasn't really helping it when I would come down off of them. Uh, when I'd lay in a motel room at night sick from dope, when I would kick, I'd get that feeling back again. And I didn't know what it was, so I thought, well, we got to do something new. So out on the streets again, popping around, seeing what we could do. By about that time, I'm about 16 or 17, and I ran into some rock and roll people. They're still on the streets today recording music. They're famous to the world. So I thought, whoa, this is weird. I like this. And what it was, they were Satan worshipers, and I didn't know it at the time. Oh, I'd go to their house, shoot methadrine with them. That's a drug that a lot of people nowadays have never heard of. You folks heard of speed, crack, cocaine. Well, methadrine, true methadrine, was an old drug that we used to steal from a pharmacy. And you would put it in a spoon, put water in a syringe, and shoot a little of it, and you would stay up for two or three days at a time. It was the best you could get, pharmaceutical drugs. So these people really liked that. So I was a hit with them because I had all I needed. All I'd have to do is just go rob another drugstore if I wanted to. No big deal. We was getting real good at it. And at that time, we was robbing three or four drugstores a day. Of course, it was at night, but we was robbing them. And I remember one time this one doctor got so tired of us breaking into his doctor's office, he would leave a note in the hallway exactly where he kept the morphine in the syringes because he was tired of the broken windows and the broken doors. I'm not lying. That's just the way it was. He was getting tired of it, so we'd go in there, take our dope, and leave. It was that simple. And we're talking, this is a crazy lifestyle. Nowadays, it's a lot different, but I'm 40 years old. Back then, you know, they thought it was older people. I had short hair. I looked innocent. No one would ever expect somebody like me. And I always wore long sleeve shirts so nobody could see my scars and my fresh tracks on my arms. So as far as they thought, huh, I'm a little goody two-shoes, you know. I got away with everything. And people could have say murder even. Yes, I did. I even got away with that, too. Huh, I thought I had them fooled. Uh, I didn't after a while. But back to my story. So after the bikers and stuff, I'm hanging with these rock and rollers, you know, doing all this. And all of a sudden, I met this witch. And I'm going, wow, you're for real, huh? And they go, yeah. And what they tried to do is cast the evil wizard inside of me to possess my body. And I was so high on drugs at that time. I know it was LSD, methadrine, cocaine, and speed, and alcohol. I did feel weird when they said the weird spell. So I don't know what happened there. But I remember looking in this woman's eyes and I could see her like a real little in, inside of her eyes sitting in a rocking chair laughing at me. 
And I thought, boy, this is bizarre. I'm getting out of here. I've been up too many days. So what I done is I split. I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and I went to Colorado for a few days. So I thought, well, I'll just go there, rent some place, and stay for a while. So I ended up staying there for 31 days. By that time, my drug supply was getting low. So I go, well, I got to do something about this. At that time, I had a brand new car, bought and paid for, no big deal had money, but I couldn't find no heroin. I was in a little tiny town uh, called uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, and everyone would look at me like I was a freak. I couldn't find no methadone clinics there. So, I mean, I started to hurt. The whiskey wasn't doing the thing. I thought, well, I'm going to have to break into another drugstore, but I don't like doing it without somebody with me. And I didn't know nobody to help pull this robbery off, so I did it myself. And at the time, I thanked somebody called God because I got away with it and I almost got caught. But at that time, I didn't know God at all. But I did thank him. And I remember every once in a while when I'd get in trouble, I'd go, oh God, if you get me out of this one, now I can look back as, oh God, I never even believed that there was a God. Only thing I believed was that there was something or somebody created this world. But nowadays, I can look back and realize there is a true God. He is a loving God. He guides and directs people's lives if we will let him. It's just that simple. We have a free choice. But let's get back to what I'm saying. And then after the rock and roll people, I remember, ah, this is a bummer. I'm getting all lonely and bummed out again. There's got to be something different. So we started racing cars, you know, at a place called Manzanita Speedway in Phoenix. And that was a whole lot of fun. We really enjoyed that for a while and then racing motorcycles. Then after six months to a year, ah, that started getting boring, you know, so we'll go on to something. Then I remember one night I was at this party. I was taking a half a pound of heroin to this man's house and they really liked the quality of the drugs because I never stepped on none of the dope I sold. When I bought it, I sold it. I didn't put no lactose in it to cut it to make more money, to make it bigger. I sold it the way it was. And I remember this Vietnamese fellow goes, I really like this stuff. It's good. And he's going, where did you get it? And I go, I got it from your country, Vietnam. And he's going, well, I haven't been there for years. So uh, we ended up doing a dope deal. And he liked it. So what he done is he took us and introduced us to some people in, in organized crime, if I may use them terms, the big boys. So we started dealing a lot of drugs at that time. And I remember bringing drugs into the United States in caskets and stuff. I mean, stuff full of heroin and stuff. That's all we brought in was heroin, period. We brought it in from Vietnam and from Mexico. We didn't care who would ever give it to us the best for, and for the cheapest. That's who we went with. So, like I said, we had all the drugs we wanted. And boy, I thought I was a big shot then because by that time I was going to a mansion. You know, I mean, I'm getting waited on by people, by servants are waiting on me and they would bring us our drugs and silver trays and glassfuls of wine, whatever we wanted. My partner would ring a bell and they would bring it to us. And I thought, this is heaven on earth. We've got it made. I was there about a week. I overdosed on drugs again. Huh, was in a coma for a while, for about the fourth or fifth time that my overdose. And I thought, oh man, it's about time I grow up. I should quit this dope. It's going to kill me. I got to change. I got to do something. So I tried to quit. Eh, of course I couldn't because that time I had the monkey on my back so bad that he took complete control and I would do whatever it took to keep the drug. So at that time, like I was saying, we was dealing a lot, uh, pounds of heroin, and uh, some people would come in from out of town and they started asking us, will you guys start transporting it to different places in the United States? No problem. We guarantee you. You want a delivery? We'll give it. We don't care if it's five pounds, 50 pounds, or 100 pounds. But all we dealt was heroin. That's all we dealt with. That's all we wanted. Because by that time, that's the only drug we wanted, that and alcohol. So we started doing that. So I've been around the United States in almost all the major airports doing dope deals. You know, that, that got old and boring for a while, you know. And by that time, I knew that the big police was really hot on us. 
because every time I would turn around, somebody would be taking a snapshot of us, you know, a picture, a stranger would walk up and show us a picture and it would have our face on it, uh, taking a casket out of the back of a pickup one time and stuff. We'd go, oh, just a friend died, brother, that's it, you know, we're just being nice, you know, doing our thing. You have nothing on us, they could never prove it. And uh, I remember one time I was walking in a place called Glendale, Arizona. And that is dope city, folks. It is drug city. People stand on the street corners and shoot dope in the daytime. They don't care. If they get busted, hey, it's a night in jail. Free food. Why do they care? They're so strung out on dope. Their mind ain't clear. And I remember I was walking down the street one day. I got out of my car, just walking along. Beautiful, sunny day. And I just kept stumbling and falling down. I was so loaded. And an undercover police officer pulled over, arrested me for under the influence of heroin, threw me in a cop car, took me to jail, and he sat in that cell with me all day. And as far as I know, all night. When I woke up the next morning, my shoes was off my feet. There was a pillow under my head, and he was sitting in the chair. And this man told me, Danny, ain't you getting tired of your lifestyle? He's going, you know, we're going to bust you someday and put you away for a long, long time, hopefully forever if you keep it up. We're getting tired of people like you. We know you're selling a lot of drugs. We know you've been in uh, different types of crimes. We know you rob people. We know you've been involved in murder. We know that you've been involved in stealing cars and things like this. It's just we cannot point it at the moment on you. But in time, we will charge you with these crimes and throw the key away. And I told them, no, nah, sir, you got the wrong fella. It's not me. And so I asked this cop. And at that time, I hated the cops. I thought they was the worst people in the world, you know. Who'd want to be around the cop, you know? I was scared of them. You know, they could do whatever they wanted. They could take my life away, my lifestyle. So I asked this cop, why'd you sit here all night? He's going, I hate to see a life wasted over a drug. He's going, believe it or not, there's more to life than sticking a needle in your arm. So I laughed at him. A couple hours later, I got bailed out of jail. Where did I go? Straight to my car, cooked up some more dope, shot it right in the car, started off again doing my own thing. And then I remember one time I got pulled over, and the police says, we got you this time, buddy. I go, for what? For right now, under the influence of heroin, possession and cells of heroin. So back to jail again I went. But this time, I never got out of jail. I had to sit in jail. And at that time, they kept me on some very, very heavy medication, nine different times. And one of them was Thorazine. And if any of you folks know about Thorazine, if you've ever done the Thorazine shuffle, you know what's up. You're a walking zombie. So they kept me on these drugs for two weeks. To, so I would kick, because you can die if you have a bad enough drug habit going through addiction. So I'm sitting in the county jail waiting to see what's up. Three months go by. They try me. They tell me, well, you're going to Arizona State Penitentiary. Okay, I accept it. I knew sooner or later it was going to happen. So from jail, they take me to another jail, and they call that maximum security. It was a place called Alhambra. It's the very first phase of going to the penitentiary. When you walk in the door, it says, Welcome to the Arizona State Penitentiary. And I thought, man, I blew it this time. But I'll get out some way. I'll escape or whatever the case may be. Well, I didn't. So I'm in there, and I was wanting dope real bad and wanting a cigarette real bad. Couldn't even get one of them. They locked me in this little room, and I was hungry. So I look. There's a little tiny bag of peanuts. For all you people that's been in jail, you know they love to feed you peanuts, right? But it was something to eat, so I ate it. And next to the bag of peanuts was something I haven't seen in years. I looked down like this, and it was an old, old book. And it said, the Holy Bible on it. And I thought, well, I'm going to need something to read, so I might as well read this Bible. 
And I told you I didn't go to school very much, and I didn't. And nowadays, I still can't read and write very well, but that's all right. I get by in life because God provides. So I opened this book called the Bible, started eating them peanuts, and I thought, well, this might not be bad. I've got to sit here a couple hours. And a scripture came to me. I opened the book to a book called Matthew. And I thought, huh, very interesting. What are all these red letters? So I started skimming through and I realized these red letters in the Bible meant this is where Jesus Christ was supposed to be talking. And I opened the Bible to Matthew chapter 28 starting in verse 18. And I would like to read that to you folks right now if I may. Because this was the beginning of changing my life. And I'll tell you what, to this dying day, I will never forget this, what happened. But before I read this, I read this when I was in jail actually prison, the very first phase. And these words stood out of this book like three or four inches each word. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought, these words really mean something. They're talking to me. So I read this, and this is what it said. And it, and it said, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power, not some power, folks, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and in the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And I thought to myself, well, what in the world is this talking about? The only thing I got out of it is Jesus has all power. So I kept reading a little more. And what it was, was Jesus Christ has all power in heaven and earth. So for right now, what I would like to do, if I may, take a few minutes, if you don't mind, and let's just see what maybe God has to say. Because remember, we was talking about the void, the empty feeling in my life. I was actually really bummed out. Drugs wouldn't fill that hole in my heart. Fast cars did not do it. Hanging around rock and roll people, freaking out with them, didn't do it. Nothing did it. The excitement of robbing a person, you don't know if you're going to get stabbed, you're going to get away with it, you're going to get busted, the adrenaline goes. That's excitement to a criminal. They like it. That's their thing. That didn't do it. Nothing filmed it. So I thought, well, if Jesus has all power, why don't I try this guy? But I didn't know how. So I personally thought that just by reading this, God spoke to me. I was one of them people called the Christian. Boy, was I ever lied to. The devil lied to me. So what I done... Now, this is funny. It really is. If you're a Christian already, you'll get a big laugh out of this. If you're lost, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about. So I was going around in this jail, waiting to go to the main penitentiary, telling people how to receive Jesus Christ. And they go, well, how's this? I go, all you got to do is say this little prayer. And they would say it. And here I thought, I've done it, right? And I thought, well, if I die right now, we'll all go to this place that the Bible calls heaven. Was I ever fooled? By the time I got to prison, I got out on the prison yard and ran into a couple people that I grew up with. So what did I do? Started shooting heroin again. The neat part about it was is I needed no money. I didn't have to go nowhere for it. And if I got busted in prison for shooting dope or selling it, what are they going to do to me? Give me more time? Throw me in lockdown? I'm already in prison. You know, the food I didn't like, but hey, it was three squares. It was free. You know, my cot was all right. I was protected by gang members. And uh, they used to call me the horse trader in there. If people wanted drugs or whatever they wanted, they came to me for it because I would get it. And I was the type of person is I didn't care what it took. I didn't care because I didn't care about life. I figured I would be dead at the age 18 or 20, so live it up how you can, you know, and that was it. So I was telling these people this, and I'm shooting drugs and just got a real bad heroin habit for about the hundredth time or more in prison. I thought, this is getting crazy. I've got to do something. And I remember in 1988, on Easter Sunday, I'm walking across the prison yard in Douglas, Arizona. It was pretty chilly out that morning. What I'm about to tell you 
changed my life. And I heard over the loudspeaker, we're having church services. And my cellmate was already in the process of getting drugs from this woman smuggled into prison. They do it all the time, and it's no big deal. We had no coffee, we had no sweets, no candy bars, no cookies in the cell. It was like 8.30 in the morning. Half the people is asleep on Sunday morning. So I thought, well, I got to do something. I'm real sick, my stomach's hurting. I got to get something. So what I did is I thought, well, I'll just go into this church service and get some free coffee or a free donut or whatever they offer. And I'll just wait until my cellmate gets off a of visitation. Then everything will be okay. I'll shoot my dope and go on about my business that day. Because see, folks, when you're in prison, it's a totally different world. But it's a real world in there. It really is. It's nothing to walk up to somebody and cut their throat for a pack of cigarettes. It's nothing to stab somebody 17, 18 times, take their eyes out. That's just part of life. Who's going to tell? Another inmate that's in there for another crime? No, people keep their mouth shut in there. I remember one time, though, before I tell you this story, when I was in there, I, I earned uh, a tattoo in there. Now, today I'm not proud of it, but when I was in the penitentiary, I thought it was one of the neatest things ever. I have a tattoo on me of an executioner. I used to kill people for money before I went into prison, and I've killed people in prison. It was no big deal. I didn't care about people's lives because, see, I never had love in my life. I never had joy in my life. All I was doing was living from day to day, waiting to die. It was that simple. But, see, what I'm getting ready to tell you changed my life. So I decided to go to this church thing. So I'm walking around and walk up the steps and everything, looking around to see if anybody else was coming in. No one. I was all by myself. And I opened that door. This is the neat part. I'll never forget it. I seen a man in a suit and a woman. The man was playing a, a guitar. I don't know what they were singing. I've never seen these people. And all of a sudden, I look, and there's a bunch of people wearing blue. It's supposed to be a joke because in Arizona, everyone wears blue in the penitentiary. And there's a few inmates in there. But I got one foot in the door, but I never got the other one in there. And Jesus Christ, this one that I read about waiting to go to prison, spoke to me with inside of me. It was God talking to me, the real God, no fake one, no phony one, God, almighty God. And he said this to me in a voice. It's like you and I talking right now. If we're talking on one and one, he says, Danny, if you want to live, accept me as your personal savior and Lord right now. So I asked God. I really didn't know how to do it the correct way. When I was a kid, I went to church, and I did confess Christ before, but I made a friend of mine a bet in another family member that I'd go down to this altar, and I won the bet by going down, you know, and I got the money because I had enough courage as a little boy to go down to the altar and confess Christ. I didn't mean it. Very obvious. My lifestyle proved that. But that day... When I asked Christ into my heart, God himself came into me. And I have not been the same person since. Because he came into my heart and he saved my soul from going to hell. And a lot of people might not believe in hell. But I would like to take a few minutes, if you don't mind, to tell you about this place. Because in Luke, it tells us something. It tells about a rich man and a poor man. The poor man died. That was Lazarus. He went to heaven. The rich man died, and he went to hell. So we find out that there was a real hell. It's all in God's word. We might turn to that in a minute. It matters. And in hell, he was tormented. And he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father Abraham, dip your finger in water because his tongue's burning. So we find out that hell's a real place by the word of God. We find out that the man was tormented in pain and anguish and he was thirst for water and he could see 
And he says, go to my house and tell my five brothers not to come to this place. See, it was too late for the rich man. Because, see, he already died. And he is in hell right now. Till this day, that rich man that God talks about in Luke is burning in the pits of hell right now. Lazarus, the man that went to heaven, is in heaven right now with God. He was a beggar here on this earth. He's perfect now. And God told this rich man, you guys don't listen to Moses. You don't listen to people. So why would I send one of the dead to go back to warn them? You don't listen to the prophets. See, nowadays we have different people sharing Jesus. Because my Bible tells me in John 14, chapter 14, it says, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. So what we have to do, if we want to change our life, if we want true life with Jesus in heaven, when we die, we have to receive Jesus Christ into our heart. And by the way, folks, a lot of people don't know that Jesus Christ is God. It tells us in his word. He came down in the form, but Jesus Christ is the almighty God, the great I am, the prince of peace, and so on. But what I want to do is take you to another scripture, if I may, real quick, and it's in the book of John. Because remember I was telling you my lifestyle. I thought it was the neatest thing ever. I had it all. I thought I've done it all. I thought what is there left? What was left was Jesus. And I thank the Lord today that he touched me in such a way that I would take the time right now to share Christ with you folks. Because I'll tell you guys, who's ever sat and watching this, you might be lonely. You might be hurting. You might be depressed. You might be a drug addict needing a fix, an alcoholic needing a drink. You might be a prostitute hooked on crack. Your pimp keeps beating you up. Or you just might be one of the nicest people in the world that's never stole nothing, raised a very moral life. But let me tell you something, folks. Without Christ, you have nothing. Without Christ, if you die, this world will be the best you'll ever have if you're lost. And stop and think. If you have asked Christ into your heart in a few minutes, this world right now is the very worst that we'll ever have for eternity. So we have a decision to make. What do we want to do? Do we want to have Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, or do we want to be our own God? The question is, is when you take your last breath, we're not going to have no more time at all to change our mind. The rich man cried out to Father Abraham for his family. Well, tonight, folks, I'm crying out to you from the love that Christ has gave me for people. And I'll tell you, God's coming back. We're going to find out in a little bit, someday. I don't care if you believe it or not, because God's word does not lie. And when God comes back, or if you die, are you ready to meet your maker? Is it going to be the death angel with a sickle? Welcome to hell. Or is it going to be Jesus with his arms out with holes in his hands and his feet? And the ray of his glory is just going to shine off and says, welcome home, my son or my daughter. You have that choice to make, and you're the only one that can. And First Samuel, God's word tells me, God looks on the outer part of man, but God looks at the heart. So see, we're not fooling nobody. I don't care how tough you are or how tough you think you are 
I don't care if you're a little punk. I don't care if you're a mom, if you're a father, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're a dentist. It makes no difference. The thing of it is, is what are you doing with your spiritual life? Are you dead? Was you raised thinking that as long as you're a goody-goody two-shoes type person that you will go to a place called heaven? Wrong. Because we're going to find out something in a minute. I want to read you another verse, if I may, real quick. It's John chapter 10 and verse 10. This is Jesus Christ talking. It says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Now, right now, he's talking about the devil. Okay? Let's get down and let's share Jesus Christ. If you people want to turn this off, fine. You've heard. I'm going to get serious for Jesus because that's what I love to do. God right now is telling us that the devil has came to steal, to kill, and destroy. He was doing that to my life. And I don't know, folks, he might be doing it to a bunch of your lives. Well, I'm sick and tired of Satan getting the victory. Let's let God into our lives. Do you guys want peace, joy, happiness? If you don't, there's something wrong with you. Because everyone, I was looking for the peace, the joy, and the happiness through all the garbage that I was doing all them years. I found it all in Jesus Christ through His precious Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit. But now listen to the last part of this verse. I just love it. It says, now this is Jesus talking. I am come that thy might have life and that thy might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. What's that mean? It means that Jesus Christ died for you and for me. For all that will receive him. It's that simple. Why would he want to give me abundant life here? Folks, he does. Once we ask Christ into our heart, and if we really mean that, and ask the Lord to be the Lord of our life, your life will start changing. Remember at the very first of this, when I came in and started talking to you people, I told you a few years back, the beautiful music that my wife Gina was singing, I'd walk by and spit on her. But I love the lady to death now, and I love the ministry that God has given her. And I praise the Lord that he gave me her. But see, there's something I love more than my wife. It's a person too. It's Jesus Christ. God himself. And what it tells us, and also in the book of John, in chapter 3, it reads this, starting in verse 15, or 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in, in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's stop right there. What do you mean, be saved from what? Be saved from the pits of hell. That's why God loves us so much that he took the time to have Jesus come down in the form as a young baby, born through the virgin birth of Mary, to walk on this earth. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about the way he died for us. But let's read verse 18 first. It says, He that believeth not on him, no, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So folks, if you're born into this world thinking that you're going to get your way to heaven by good works, by being a good person, we found out one thing in John 10:10 10, 10, that the devil's a thief and a liar and he steals souls. We find out that without Christ, you're already condemned to the pits of hell. And that's for eternity. That's not for 10 years, 20 years. Stop and think one thing. Only thing that we know for sure right now is we're alive. We're not promised tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. We can't do a thing about yesterday. And we can't do a thing about tomorrow. We might be dead. We don't know what it's going to bring. But we can do something right now at the very moment. We don't know what's going to happen an hour from now, do we? No. But God does. So, I'll tell you what, I want to share a couple more things with you 
if I may, because God tells me some certain things that he would like for me to share. And by the way, for all you people that are out there, I'm being very mellow and nice. I really am, because I'm a radical person for Jesus Christ. I love God, and I'm not ashamed of God. But in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says all, A-L-L. -L. That means if you are alive, if you're watching, Right now, you are a sinner, whether you like it or not. That's just a fact. God says it. I believe it. Case closed. But there's something we can do about that. In Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So right there we find out, there you have it. The gift of God. And you ask, how do I get this gift of God? It's a free gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. We deserve to burn it in hell. Look at what I just shared with you folks. I deserve to be in the penitentiary until my dying day. And then they ought to keep me there another week to make sure I'm dead. And then bury me. But God's got other plans. Why? Because he's changed my life. I let him. And that was the greatest thing that I have ever done. Because God tells me in his precious word, if I shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. It's a free gift. But the problem of it is, folks, is God's offering it to us right now, but we have to really receive it. Because in the book of Matthew, it tells us not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So remember, we find out in 1 Samuel, God knows the heart. And I think it's time right now to start getting serious about our lives. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? You're tired of sticking needles in your arms? You're tired of beating people up? Are you tired just cruising around, having really nowhere to go? I'll tell you what, you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and ask Him to be the Lord of your life and He'll guide and direct you. Life won't be perfect until we get to heaven. But I'll tell you what, I can't believe how much fun it is, what the people call rejoicing. What's that? Just getting together and having a good time. A few years ago, I, I, I would have never even tried it. But nowadays, it's different because these people have smiles on their face. They're content. They're happy. They don't care if they got a lot of money. They don't care if they live in a big fancy home. They don't care if they ain't riding the best Harley or the oldest Indian that they can buy for a lot of you bikers or the people. They don't need the fancy Mercedes Benz. All they need is directions from Jesus Christ. And one way that he gives it is through his precious word. There are 66 books in this Bible. And I'll tell you what, it's the best books ever written. I don't care if you like it or accept it. That's up to you. But I'll tell you what, it changed my life. And if it's changed my life, folks, stop and think right now. What if one of you are watching right now that you're just starting? Let's start with a teenager. What if you're just now getting into crimes and drugs? Do you want to go as far as I did? At age 17, a doctor told me my insides was like an 80-year-old man. I said, you're a liar. Called him a punk and I spit on him. Why? I didn't want to hear the truth. And I kept going. I'll tell you what, I could have died. And if I would have died, I would have been in hell where that rich man is. In hell, you cannot get out of it. Once you're there, you're there. But we're going to find out one thing first. So this tells us one thing. What are we going to do with our lives? Are you sick and tired of it? Are you still having fun? And if, it, if you are, stick another needle in your arm, brother or sister. Do a blast, but guess what? What if you don't wake up? Where is it going to take you? I'd say to the pits of hell by reading what God says. I'll tell you what, if we really are saved, we ain't going to want to shoot the dope no more. We ain't going to want to drink the booze. We ain't going to want to go on them big runs. Have a good old time. What we're going to want to do is share Jesus Christ, try and be a good person. It's a lot of fun. It really is. And I want to share something with you, if I may, real quick. In chapter 
10 of the same book of Romans. Remember, it says, starting in 9, if, that if I shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I want to stop right there. In verse 11, right now, I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I know what God's done for me in my life. But now, if you're listening, you have the opportunity to receive Christ right now. Or you have the opportunity to reject Christ. And he tells us we're not supposed to be ashamed of Jesus. When I was in prison, we started a church there on a picnic, me and two other inmates. Now, I'm getting ready to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, one of the saddest stories in the whole world. One of these fellows had helped start this church. We started it in pouring down rain. It rains a lot in Douglas, Arizona, on a little picnic table. And through that, we're being faithful, reading the Word and everything, doing what God's wanting us to do, witnessing the other inmates, reading His Word, praying, fasting, doing everything, you know. Uh, not being ashamed of Jesus to the other inmates. So we opened the door where we got our own little building. So, wow, praise God, that was a church. Okay, and all this time, this one inmate was a confessed Christian. The day he walked out, he ended up being one of my cellmates, by the way. The day he was walking out of prison at 8 o'clock that morning, he had one of these things called the Holy Bible, folks. And he says, I don't need this no more. He threw it on the bed. He's going, I'm free. I said, no, you ain't. Four days later, the man died of overdose of heroin, I found out. I don't know where he is. Only God does. But I'll tell you what, we really do need God and his word if we want to have a happy life. There's no one on the face of this earth does not want to have love and peace and joy in their life. I don't care what you say. I don't care if you love being a very bitter and miserable person. Down deep, you want love and you want somebody to love you. Right now, Christ wants to love you. What Jesus done, remember I told you we would get to this. He was a carpenter's son. So he was a carpenter. At the age of 30, he had a ministry. Now stop and think, back in them days, they never had bicycles, vehicles, or nothing. They had camels, or they walked. God's word tells me that Jesus did not even have a place to lay his head. They would sleep on top of mountains and rocks and stuff like that. He would go around and minister to people. What God would do is he would heal the sick, open the blind's eyes, heal the leopards. But most of all, he would save their soul from hell. And then one day, they kept saying, who do we crucify? If you people remember that they came and there was a certain man for money. Nowadays, we call him a snitch. He told authorities about Christ, where he would be. And that's Judas Iscariot, the word of God tells us. And he says, you will know this man by I walk up and I'll kiss him. So what they did, Christ went with these people. And they took him, captured God. But see, God allowed this for you and I. And when he was holding trial, he wasn't staying at the fancy motel. God wasn't at that mansion that I used to party in. I'd probably call it a dungeon, folks, with criminals and lowlifes as far as the world's concerned. My lifestyle, I led. No, God himself was in a dungeon. And he came before Caesar. Couldn't find no fault in this man. They kept screaming, crucify him, crucify him, kill him. Why? They didn't want Christ around, folks. Because they wanted to do their own thing. Just like me. I wanted him to do my thing. So what they done is they found Christ guilty. The crowd did. His own people rejected him. And they nailed him on a tree. 
and hung him next to two people, thieves. And in them days, being crucified was a criminal's way of death. It would be like us going to the gas chamber today. And guess what? When Christ was hanging on that tree, he took your sins and my sins and the whole world's sins upon us. Because right here in Romans, Chapter 5, verse 8, it says, But God commanded His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So see, Jesus died for me that day when I'm shooting drugs. Jesus died for you, whatever you're doing right now. Before Jesus died, all the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future, was on Him. God Himself became sin for us. And before he died, he done something, folks. He screamed toward the heavens, Father, why did I forsake thee? He didn't forsake him. It was part of the thing that Jesus had to do for us. And there's two people on each side of him. One person rejected him. But one of them men said, Christ he confessed Jesus as God. Don't forget me this day. And Jesus says, today you shall be with me in paradise. So right there, that proves me, folks, that I don't have to go around and give a bunch of hallelujahs and praise God and knock on doors, which is good, don't get me wrong, and hand these people a track on how to receive Jesus. If I go to church and give them money, I'll go to heaven. That's all a bunch of pack of lies, I'm telling you. God says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That thief on that cross that day believed Jesus was God and accepted that. And right now, right now, he's in heaven with Jesus. Someday, I'm going to be in heaven with Jesus. Are you? You have that choice. I hope you make the right one because I'll tell you what. Have you ever noticed something? The days are getting shorter. The months are getting shorter. And the years seem like about four or five months nowadays. That's called we're getting older, folks. And we're getting tired. We're getting wore down. We need rejuvenated some way. I'll tell you what. If you let Jesus Christ in your life, you'll get rejuvenated. You'll get on fire for God. That's what it's all about, folks. It really is. I could keep on going and telling you about a lot of different things that I have done in my life, but I don't want to. I want to tell you about Jesus Christ and what He has done. And a lot of people say, but that was then. What about now? Let me tell you something. God used these men to wrote this Bible in a mighty way. Paul, Apostle Paul, used to go around killing confess Christians and enjoying it. And he wrote most of the Bible. He's in heaven right now with God too. And I'll tell you what, there's other people. Look at Moses. He disobeyed God. He done his own thing. He was on the run for murder, just like me. God used him in a mighty way. God blessed Abraham. So if you want happiness and joy and a blessing, why don't you try God? We've tried everything else. The things I've tried all faded away. Because, see, God tells me in His precious Word, which it only makes sense even if I didn't believe and accept Christ right now. I've been to too many funerals and seen too many of them. I used to dig graves for a living. I used to be a pole barrier, too, in prison. I buried people. And I noticed when we would close that lid on that casket, they wouldn't have a bunch of money on them, maybe some jewelry. Some of the people would steal the jewelry. They didn't care. You know, I didn't need it. They didn't have their homes in there. They didn't have happiness. They never had nothing, folks. You can't take it with you when you go. And we're all going. We all know that. We all know we're going to die. Where are you going to go when you die? In the meantime, are you tired of being the way you are? 
Nowadays, you turn on the TV, and what do you see? You see channels, I need help in this, I need help in that. And that's great because they do have a lot of, lot of great things to help out. But I'll tell you who will help you. Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man coming to the Father but by Him. So I'm going to encourage you folks to do that tonight. And what I'm going to do is say a little prayer right now. If you're listening, this is the most important decision you're going to make right now. Then afterwards, I still have some more talking to do. But if you really mean this, say this after me. Jesus, I know I've been a sinner. Jesus, I ask you right now to come into my heart. And save me from going to hell when I leave this face of this earth. Jesus, will you please take over and be the Lord and master of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to go to heaven when I leave the face of this earth. Amen. Now, folks, if you really have done this, and mean it in your heart, you will go to heaven. But the most important thing is, there's great news now. You don't have to wait to go to heaven to rejoice in Jesus Christ. If you don't have a Bible, what you need to do is go out and get a Bible, a holy Bible, and find somebody, if you don't know anybody, and sit down and start reading it. Husband, if you just received Christ, God's Word tells me you're the head of the house. What you need to do is start being a real man, the man God would have you to be. Start having Bible times, sharing with your wife, your family, your children. That's what God would have you to do. And, and uh, find a new church to go to that preaches the Word of God, that shares Jesus Christ. See, if, if you go to a church or a gathering, it doesn't make a, no difference where it is. It don't matter if it's outside or within buildings. But if you go to a church and they don't mention nothing about Jesus Christ, if I was you, I'd be looking for another place to go. If they don't teach out of the Word of God, get out of there. Because I tell you what, that's the old devil that we read about in John 10.10. 10. The thief has came here to destroy and to kill. Because he don't want you to have that abundant life that we was reading about in the last of that verse. But God wants you to have that. Let God start working in your life. And as far as I'm concerned, in my personal life, after I received Christ, I went back to my prison cell. I don't know what they taught, what they sang. And I just sat on the bunk in my cell. And tears just started rolling down my face. And I can't explain this, but I'm going to try. It felt like big heavy weights or something inside of me was just coming out. And, and it felt like something real happiness and mellow. And it's like listening to a good song. It just makes you feel real good inside. I can't explain it. But I guess God was getting all that garbage out of me and come to find out it was His Spirit coming in me, pushing the garbage out. But see, folks, we have to let God be the Lord of our life also if we want our personal relationship with Christ to keep going. We just can't receive Christ and then say nothing because we found out already in the book that I've shared with you in Matthew, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. It's just those who really believe. And I'll tell you what, if you're a saint that's out there right now, making fun of me, I don't care. You're not making fun of me. You're making fun of God. And I want to share another verse of the Bible with you all, if I may. And I know that this is a true book because people, since I have been off of heroin, since the Lord's delivered me off of this drug, I've had doctors and different people say, it's impossible 
See, when I had that drug addiction after I asked Christ in my heart in that hallway, I never went through withdrawals no more. Before, I used to go through them and thought I would die. But from that moment on, God never had no uh, other plans for me except to give me His love, His peace, His joy. But i got to receive them. But this is what's going to happen to us if we don't receive Christ. Because someday, we will die. This is in, in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, starting in verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophets are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. I want to stop there for a minute. It said, And the devil that deceived them. Well, who's the devil deceiving? My friend, the devil's been deceiving this whole world for many, many, many years. And he's going to keep doing it until God comes back. We're going to find out in a little bit about that to get his children and take them up to heaven. Okay? And the devil wants to steal all your happiness, all your joy. But here's what's going to happen. And I saw a great white throne and them that sat on it, from whom his face on the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was a s found no place for them. We're talking about the people that did not ask Christ into their heart. Listen to this. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was open. I'm going to stop for a minute. I think the books they're talking about personally are the 66 books. We're going to find out. Now, that's just my personal opinion. But we're going to find out about this one book for sure. And it says, which is a book of life? And the dead were, were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in them. And the dead and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to his works. And the dead in hell were cast into the lake of fire. I said the lake of fire, not the lake of happiness, not heaven. Hell, fire. This is a second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Right now, friends, if you have asked Jesus into your heart, like this little prayer we had, you're written down in the Lamb's book of life. You, there's actually a book in heaven, and your name was written down. And if you've done that, the heavens opened up, the angels are rejoicing, because why? Another one's coming home to God. And if you've done that, we've done upset the devil. And that just tickles me to death because he's nothing but a punk, a thief, a chump. The reason I know because that lousy little bum has destroyed most of my life. But he's not doing it no more. I say, and I'm going to talk to you Christians because I'm running out of time right now. Let's get down to the nitty gritty, folks. If you are a child of God, God's word tells us to go ye therefore and teach all nations. We're talking about on your job, share Jesus Christ, on your uh, uh, unemployment line, if you're looking for work, in the grocery stores at home, knock on your neighbor's door, share Jesus. Let your light shine for Jesus. And if you're going, well, why should I do that? I'm already a Christian, so somebody don't go to hell like we just read forever. It's about time that the world wake up. Let's revive our souls so we can go out and share Jesus. I'm sick and tired of these people that call themselves Christians that sit around and do nothing. Because someday God's going to come back. And i got to read this real quick because we're almost out of time. And this is why I want you folks to do this because we don't know when it's coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 15 it says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive, I'm alive, I'm up here talking to you people, you people are alive because you're listening. And remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself, we're talking about Jesus Christ, folks. The Lord God, Almighty God, 
shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these things. I know too many Christians, folks, that don't comfort nobody with these things. They have got saved and, and they go to church, praise God, they're faithful, they tie, they pray. But they don't comfort one another, folks. So let's get busy and let's share Jesus. And the neat part about this is, folks, if you deny yourself, Luke 9, 23 says, if we will deny ourselves and pick up our cross on Sundays and follow him, we'll go to heaven. Folks, it don't say Sunday. It says daily. That means every day of our life. No matter if we talk, if we can't talk, we can pray. Pray that people would go out and share Jesus Christ. See, I ran out of time, and I'm going to tell you real quick, my desire is share Jesus Christ with whoever I can until God takes me home because he has gave me that to do, and that's what I want to do because I know how it was. I've lived on, on hell in this earth as far as the world's concerned. I've just shared a little tiny bit about the wickedness and the evil that I've done. I've done a lot of things I'd never even share with you folks. But God forgave me because I really asked him. So, if we're Christians, let's get on the ball. Let's get revived. And if you cannot get revived for Jesus Christ, if you are saved, I'd check my relationship with God. Because something's wrong. And if you're lost, I pray that you might receive Christ today before it's too late. Because someday we're going to take our last breath. And you have that decision to do. And I'll tell you what, if this video saves one soul, if it's shown a million or a billion times, praise God because the devil lost another one. So I want to encourage you people today. To quit looking at the material things out on this earth and look to God for guidance and directions in your life. We shouldn't want things from God. We should want to be His servant. Serve God. What can we do for you today, Jesus? Stop and think. He done the ultimate for us. He went to hell for you and me. And if you're a Christian, I'm asking you, what have you done for Him today? If you haven't done nothing, you ought to be on your knees crying and asking God to forgive you. Because I have to ask God to forgive me all the time. Because in my job, sometimes I work ten and a half plus hours. And I want to go home and give my wife a kiss because I love her. So I'm guilty too. But I'll tell you what, if we ask, he'll forgive us. Because 1 John 1, 9 says, If I shall confess what our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So that's what I'm encouraging you folks to do today. Is let God have his way. Because that's what he wants. Because see, when he died on that cross, if we receive him, he bought and paid for us. That means he owns us. And he wants nothing but the very best for you and I. So if you're tired of being tired, run in the streets, being Mr. Cool, Mr. Macho, come on. Let God have his way. That's what it's really about, isn't it? Because I'll tell you what, your friends and your buddies and your wives and, and all this ain't going to be standing up there. They're not going to die with you. You die by yourself. Your soul goes one way or the other, to heaven or hell. You ain't going to take your friends with you. I used to have a saying, heaven don't want me and hell's afraid I'll take over. Praise God, he touched my heart. Because you know what? The devil was just lying to me, like he's lying to you people right now. And I'll tell you what, God has such a great plan for you. He wants to love you. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you joy. He, and this is true love. Love is God. God is love, folks. He wants to give you true peace. True happiness. Not of the world, but of Him. But you have to receive Jesus and really mean it. And if you do, don't let the devil deceive you and tell you no difference. Get into a Bible-believing church. 
Start praying. Seek the Word of God. God's Word tells us to study to show thyself approved. Read the Word. Like I was telling you when I was sitting in that jail cell, God was already dealing with me. Those words started to come alive. And I was leading people to Jesus, and I was lost, and I thought I was saved. That's how sneaky the devil is. But I'll tell you what, let's don't give the devil victory. Let's praise God, because that's what I like to do. See, when I was talking about my past, personally, I'm going to share something. I talk too much, but we we're making a video for testimony, so I had to tell you some of the bad things I'd done. I'd rather tell you more about Jesus. But you know what? There will be somebody that can. And if there's not, if you receive Him, start talking to Him out loud. Going down the street on your work. And guess what? Before you know it, you'll start hearing Him talk back. He's real, folks. He's not fake because I know He's changed my life. See, I had a totally different lifestyle than my wife. She was a Christian most of her life. I just want to say I love you and I just pray you receive Christ.